Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you are watching. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all joining us from around the world for our session today on mobilizing action for climate change as part of the forum's Davos Agenda 2021 this week. Now, 2021 is a decisive and opportune year for economies, industries, and society at large to strengthen alliances and unlock the potential to accelerate climate action globally. And China continues to play an important leadership role in this respect. It is therefore my absolute pleasure to welcome today the distinguished Minister of Ecology and Environment, Mr. Huang Ran Chiu of the People's Republic of China to open today's discussion by sharing China's vision and commitment to accelerating climate action both nationally and globally. Minister Hung Rang Chiu holds a doctorate degree in engineering and was a professor for nearly two decades. He took office as the Minister of Ecology and Environment of China in April 2020, having served as Vice Minister of the then Ministry of Environmental Protection of China since 2016. Minister Hung Rang Chiu, a very, very warm welcome to Davos Agenda 2021. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Your kind words. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I am very pleased to attend uh, this in Davos uh, agenda dialogue and to attend this session. Climate change is the biggest uh, challenge facing the human uh, humanity to pursue low uh, low carbon uh, development is the biggest question facing all of us um, in the first uh, in the beginning of the, this year we carry out this dialogue it is the right moment two days ago uh, mr xi jinping the president of the china attended the uh, dial, um, davos agenda he um, uh, made a special address for a shared future of the mankind and he um, provided in china's vision um, in this uh, uh, pandemic situation we are all aware that we only have one planet and we only have one shared future we need to work together because we are a one community to work together to face climate change. This is the um, po most powerful tool. China uh, seems long time always put a lot of attention into climate change uh, actions. The Xi Jinping said that that is our own uh, task and not forced by the others to uh, work in this field. We need to do it um, very well um we have decreased the emission uh, hugely and and non fossil um energy have already reached 15% we have reached the um in advance the target um in 2020 there's a solid base for further actions Last year, in the General Assembly, in the general debate of the UN, Mr. Xi Jinping um, have uh, promised um, before 2030, uh, China's emission will reach the peak and to uh, reach neutrality in 2060. And in many international meetings, uh, including yesterday, um, in the special address, he uh, reiterated our target and uh, we will implement it that uh, last year uh, mr xi jinping uh, in, in the climate summit he uh, promised uh, in 2030 um, compared to 1995 will the emission will decrease about 60 percent and also the forest uh, um, will hugely in, uh, increase we would also 
uh, developed our solar um, power and wind um, power. All these measures all shows that the proactive actions taken by the Chinese government to pursue a green development to promote the shared uh, future of the humankind. And our 14th five-year plan um, also include the uh, measures that the, uh, to aim to the, uh, in, uh, decrease of the emissions in our uh, five-year plan. The neutrality uh, efforts will be our main focus in the future. And to face uh, climate change, we are pushing forward uh, this work and is uh, more and more integrated into all uh, aspects of the economy. China is uh, still a developing country to achieve um, carbon neutrality will require huge efforts to reach the peak and further to reach neutrality will also be uh, the future drives of our future uh, social and economic development. How to do that? First, the short-term targets and long-term visions will be combined. We will aim um, to uh, implement the uh, actions to achieve um, the peak in 2030. There will be roadmaps and actions be uh, rolled out. We strengthen all the efforts to, uh, for example, to push the um, coal consumption to reach um, the the peak, the earliest possible. All this uh, to aim to achieve the strategic objective of um, carbon neutrality in 2060. And we will focus on the key uh, industries and key policies. Uh, second, in the 14th five years uh, plan, and uh, we will uh, roll out the constraints on the industries and the regions to aim to reach the peak and neutrality. There will also be specific uh, action plans. And, and to, to push forward our work in environment uh, protection and economic development. Third, we will accelerate the building up of the carbon market. China has already launched the uh, market, and now 45% uh, of a CO2 emission is covered, uh, especially it covers the uh, power plants. And then in the later, we will further develop this um, market and to have more players involved in this market and to provide more products with carbon pricing and to uh, give it a role of a leverage. And uh, third, we will we, accelerate our uh, adaption uh, efforts. We aim to 2035 in all fields, uh, we all have um, adaption uh, objectives to increase resilience overall and also to share our experience with the um, other uh, countries. And for, uh, fifth, we will strengthen the South South cooperation. We have our already planned 1.2 billion. Um, US dollars in these corporations. We have signed 39 agreements, bilateral agreements, and we have also organized 145 uh, trainings uh, with more than 2,000 specialists trained. 
in the future, no, we will uh, roll out uh, pilot projects and also um, improve um, our uh, works in other fields such as uh, training and to further provide our help to the uh, to the others and we we also provide more uh, green public uh, goods to our to other countries ladies and, and gentlemen we have a lot of work to do we need comprehensive um, participation of all i have uh, three suggestions first we need to forge a consensus. We have a shared future. Multilism, a win win, is the only choice. The um, goals are uh, common but differentiated. We all need to pursue the, these objectives. The protectionism is not the way. The developed um countries need to make up um what has not been done uh, for the previous not attained object uh, objectives and also they, they should be um combined with other efforts uh, like uh, economic development and um poverty relief and it is urgent need the of developed countries need to act first and to roll out contract measures and to effectively support the developing countries and to aim a, a long-term action. And second, we need to learn uh, from each other all the parties based on the principle of a mutual um, beneficial uh, principle to use multilateral um, mechanisms and to uh, let all parties, including private sector, um, non-profit organizations to participate in these efforts to provide a huge platform to uh, promote um, knowledge uh, sharing. We are willing mm, to uh, work with others to achieve concrete good result for uh, this year's COP26 and to share with the others the green, beautiful future. Thank you very much. I would wish all the success to this, um, to this forum. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minister um, Hong Chu, uh, for those opening words and for sharing China's ambitious roadmap for tackling climate change. You've really laid the foundations, I think, for the conversation, both with the long-run vision and the short-run commitments to 2030. Allow me now to introduce our moderator for today's panel discussion on mobilizing climate action, Tian Wei, renowned host of World Insight at China Global Television Network and a good friend of the World Economic Forum. Tian Wei, over to you. Thank you so much, Dominique, uh, for your guidance of this session. And thank you especially to Minister Huang from China for outlining China's specific plan and action from 2021 to 2035 and eventually to 2060 and also efforts for international cooperation. Having said that though, mobilizing action on climate change is a common tax for all of us. In order to do it well, I'm so honored to be joined by a very strong panel. They are coming from different parts of Asia and Europe and they're going to provide us with great insights. And today, uh, after the discussion, we're also going to invite some questions coming from participants of uh, Davos Agenda. We hope that we will have some time to answer your questions. So my honor to introduce the panelists. Yuriko Koike, who is the governor of Tokyo from Japan. Good to see you. Thank you very much. Christian Momentale, who is the group uh, CEO of Swiss Re, now based in Switzerland. Good to see you. Thank you and certainly our fellow YGL, especially hello to you. 
and also Teresa Rivera, Deputy Prime Minister, Minister for Ecological Transition of Spain. What a pleasure. Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you. Last but certainly not least, we have uh, Hak Chou Xin, who is the CEO of LG Chem from the Republic of Korea. Good to see you. Hello, everyone. Hello, let's jump directly into the conversation. I know all of you have a lot to share. Go to you uh, first, uh, Madam Deputy Prime Minister from Spain. Earlier, the Chinese side already outlined their specific agenda, action, and plan. Now, here's the term for Europe and also for your country, Spain. What are your plans, concrete steps, and actions? Share with us, please. Thank you. Thank you so much for this question and for having the chance to, to discuss with you all. I, there are two ideas that Minister Huang stressed that I share very much. The first of them, thinking in terms of one community. So it is our own task being responsible of the government, company or local community. I think that this is very important. And the other issue is how far we can reach uh, linking values such as prosperity, inclusiveness, opportunities, cooperation with climate action. And this is what we try to do. I like this idea of um, going through a race to be the first ones to be more prosperous and more committed climate action. And this is what Europe tries to do when thinking about a concrete uh, set of policies and regulations to be the first continent to become carbon neutral. So policies through a climate law that applies through all the European policies, not just the environmental ones, reach the climate neutrality and goals on adaptation, but also to be at the very heart of the recovery. I think that uh, going through these eyes when thinking about economic prosperity is very important. So the do not harm principle, finance and economy is very important and we cannot add a, um, additional harm. The European Investment Bank uh, becoming a climate bank, so to facilitate the transformation. Thinking in terms of the external dimension is also important. This is something that we all want to stress too. So the climate finance contributions, the external dimension of the European Green Deal in terms of cooperation, in terms of trade, so to be consistent, to reach our goals cooperatively with other uh, partners and countries. And this is what we also try to do in Spain. We are going through a very important uh, set of uh, policies and uh, regulations to achieve the climate neutrality by 2050, but to reach very ambitious goals in terms of energy efficiency, 39% by 2030, or renewable energy to become um, a, a renewable, at least in 75% in the electric uh, power sector by 2030, and fully renewable uh, uh, as soon as possible and before 2050. The um, just transition is very important. I think that uh, the transformation cannot go if it is not linking to social values or so the just transition for workers and different little towns, but also to take care of those that feel menaced by the transformation. So the, the, the windows of opportunity to invest in those feeling vulnerable in terms of access and cost of energy or in terms of impacts of climate change is very important. And these are part of uh, the things we are doing uh, because as the uh, Minister Juan said we think that it is our own responsibility for our own cities and societies i think that this is key in a cooperative mood but thinking on our own responsibility when taking action thank you so much uh, deputy prime minister ribera uh, what some of the points you said are extremely important uh, how we do sustainable development fight against climate change while at the same time take care of the economy when also the partnership as you just mentioned within the country and beyond thank you let's go next uh, to the ceo of uh, swiss re uh, mr momentale of course everybody know this is the challenge and so many countries, governments have already pledged carbon neutrality. They have a specific plan. What does that mean for businesses? Why sustainable development and also uh, fight against climate change so important now for global companies? Yeah, thank you, uh, Tianwei. And happy to give you a bit of a perspective around the, the corporate sector because we have clients all around the world. So I, I see some observations. So maybe, maybe three points. 
The first one, I think many people don't realize that uh, the companies operate in very different systems all over the world, different cultures. And we always talk about shareholder capitalism, but that's really a, a US centric uh, thinking because in, in the US, there's a law which says that the board of directors has to act in the benefit of the shareholders. Very few people know that in Europe, that's not the case. Many European countries, for example, Switzerland, uh, the law is actually that the board of directors has to act uh, for the company in the interest of the company. So it's a multi-stakeholder concept. But of course, Europe has been heavily influenced by the US. And so there's a, there's a little <laughs> overlay here. But here, having uh, friends from, from China and Japan, two societies I've, I visit a lot, obviously, they have a very different approach to that. There's a, a there's more ancient philosophy behind it. There's the harmonious society concept in China, for example. And it is obvious to me that my clients who are in, in China and, and Japan, for example, when they take decisions, it's always multi-stakeholder. It's always thinking about the consequences the decisions will have on the overall society, on the employees, et cetera. So that's a very different starting position not enough people are aware of. So when the, the CEOs of the US companies last year uh, made a, a letter saying multi-stakeholder is important, we need to transition to that. Uh, it was a courageous step for them in their context but I guess the rest of the world, the CEOs thought, uh, welcome to the club. Right? There's <laughs> nothing special about that. <laughs> so second observation is uh, the transition of consciousness of CEOs around the problem of climate change. This happened quite a while ago. When I take Davos or so, I would say maybe 15 years, very few people knew about that. But 10, 8 to 10 years ago, I would say there was a transition of opinion. The majority of CEOs knew this is a serious challenge and we need to tackle it. But because of the different systems they're in, there was not a lot of action. The action happened in those companies where it's easy to do, like Swiss Re, it's easy to do. I, I could cut emissions, everything, because it's not that expensive for us. But the, all the industries where it's very difficult to do, if you're in steel industry, if you're in cement industry, transportation, it's very expensive to do the transition. And the CEOs didn't see a mandate. They didn't see enough you know, reason to do that. And they were afraid of, of getting out of business. So that's why, even though the transition of consciousness was there, you didn't see a lot of action. So what's different now? My third observation would be uh, that finally the, 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 the loop is closing. And certainly in the Western world, there's been a movement of shareholders. That's the decisive action. The shareholders are changing their opinion. The public opinion is shifting. Major shareholders are pension funds. Pension funds feel the pressure and start to put the pressure on companies that they have to transition uh, to, the, to this net zero world. It started in Nordic country in, in Europe, uh, but it came down south and it went over to Canada and then to the US. And now you can see this movement about two years ago it started is very strong. Every meeting I have with shareholders, they ask me around ESG, where we are, uh, it's becoming stronger and stronger. And so yesterday, I can say it maybe accumulated in the letter of Larry Fink, who is the uh, <laughs> CEO of the biggest asset manager, as you know, in the US, <laughs> uh, to, to basically say the companies who don't commit to net zero 2050 will be left behind, uh, which is, a, I think, a strong symbol. And I can see enormous interest now of companies, also of the, the steel industry, of all other industries. They know it's real, the pressure is huge. Uh, and I think there's a big need to collaborate across businesses to, to find solutions around that. So I, I really think we're in a tipping point uh, in terms of action. And I'm, I'm happy to elaborate later, maybe a little bit more on that. Thank you, Christian, for that. Uh... It's always wonderful to have people catching up, at least on this cause, right? Uh, the climate change, as you just mentioned, whether it's a stakeholder only and shareholders only, or it is more multiple parties uh, participation is always welcome. But you, what you said is very important from consciousness now to real action. That is the thing we want to emphasize today. Thank you so much. Having said that though, talking about Asia, we want to go to the governor of Tokyo from uh, Japan, uh, Ms. Koi Okay, I uh, understand that your metropolitan government has been working very hard on a plan and action about uh, green recovery toward a decarbonization. Tell us more about the details, particularly from a locality's perspective, please. 
Well, thank you, uh, Away, for introducing me. And thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to speak at the Davos agenda. And the current president of the World Economic Forum, you know, Mr. Bo Boge Brende, uh, he was my reliable counterpart when both of us served as the Minister of the Environment of Norway and Japan. <laughs> So I'm delighted to participate in this meeting under the leadership of Brent Bogi, the president of the World Economic Forum. Now, in order to tackle both the COVID-19 crisis and the climate crisis, it is crucial that actions are taken not only at the national level, but cities which are on the front lines of these emergencies. For economic recovery from COVID-19 pandemic, in addition to measures to counter climate change, Tokyo is advancing a sustainable recovery. Now, the actions we take during this decade to the 2030 milestone are crucial in realizing zero emission Tokyo, which will help achieve net zero CO2 emissions by 2050. Now we here announced that Tokyo will, by 2030, reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 50% from year 2000 levels and increase the use of electricity generated from renewable sources to 50%. Now, in order to cut carbon emissions by half, we are calling on the people and business of Tokyo to work together with us to change our actions. We call this initiative Time to Act, Carbon Up <laughs> Dial. So under this slogan, Time to Act, from co uh, uh, consciousness to act, to action. Uh, under this slogan, Time to Act, we wish everyone to accelerate effective act action against climate change. And in addition, green finance, which combines the environment and finance is essential as investment into the future. So the Tokyo Metropolitan Government is advancing studies for the creation of a green finance market, and we hold a preparatory meeting with experts on February 3rd, uh, next week. So by establishing itself as a leader in the world's green finance market, Tokyo will make sure that financial flows are re redirected to ESG investing and invite investment into the future from both with, uh, within and outside Japan, and of course from Switzerland. Thank you. Thank you, Governor Koike. Uh, I'm so glad that we are having a panel of uh, European and also Asian government and business leaders because there's really a lot to compare notes about. Many are taking concrete steps, as you said, time to act. I love that slogan, <laughs> by the way. Uh, having said that, let's move on to our next speaker coming from South Korea, also in Northeast Asia. We have uh, uh, Mr. Shin from LG Chem, CEO of LG Chem. Good to see you, Mr. Shin. I know your company are doing two things. One is trying to work on the climate change issue from the perspective of manufacturing process within your company. The other is also to work with the government on the concrete plans and fulfilling of those plans. But, you know, tell us more about as business leader as you are, what are some of the most important agenda for you? How to keep the balance some of the earlier speakers already talked about? Go ahead, Mr. Shin. Well, first of all, thanks for the opportunity. It's my great pleasure to uh, speak to all of you in the audience. Uh, I'm running the company by the new LG Chem, the $30 billion dollar uh, petrochemical based company is one of those uh, industries that Christian mentioned as far as a hard to convert type uh, uh, industry. Uh, but I tell you, I was to, and then I have a couple of points to make uh, relative to uh, the subject. Uh, in 2019, our company, LG Chem, uh, emitted 10.5 million tons of CO2 as a company. When we launched a CEO initiative uh, in early 2019, the task force came back with an astonishing projection that if we keep doing what we are doing and growing at current rate without major intervention, our company will be emitting 40 million tons of CO2 by 2050. That's four times the current emission level. That harsh realization uh, actually prompted us to think about the whole subject very seriously which led up to declaration of LG Chem's 
2050 carbon neutrality initiative, which was announced. Our 2050 goal calls for holding 2050 emission level at 2019 level or a reduction of 30 million tons of CO2 annually by 2050. To put this number into perspective, 30 million tons of CO2 every year reduction is equivalent to the amount of CO2 generated by 12.5 million internal combustion engine vehicles. Or it can also be offset by planting as many as 220 million trees. So we are talking about daunting task here. We knew from the beginning that the only way to make this work is working backwards from our 2050 goalpost and actually find a way to get there. Using the right to left thinking with a clear leadership commitment and accountability attached to each milestone. Otherwise, we knew from the get-go this is not going to happen. We deployed a full range of famous avoid, reduce, and compensate tactics with specific milestones assigned by business, by geography, and by each plant site. Some of our key strategy includes, number one, practicing renewable energy 100 in all of our global manufacturing operations. And number two, significant R&D effort to commercialize breakthrough technologies, such as carbon capture and utilization to directly reduce carbon from our petrochemical manufacturing processes. And number three, replacing, replacing fossil fuel-based raw ingredients with bio-based raw materials. So it has been a daunting task and we are in the second year journey now. But so far, obviously, we think we are still closer to the beginning than to the end. But I can feel after a year and a half of all out effort that we now have a pathway, we can see the pathway to get there by 2050. You mentioned what is my friendly advice to my colleagues around the world who may be in the same shoes as me, like CEOs and business le leaders around the world, is the leadership commitment at the top is the only way to make this happen. So actually I propose a three step, step recommendation that I have for all CEOs and industry leaders around the world to make this happen. And that is commit, operationalize, and engage. Mm -hmm. First, we should commit ourselves to the goal and declare that this is your personal priority as a CEO, otherwise it's not gonna happen. And then operationalize. In other words, set a specific milestone and develop actionable plans to get there. Without clearly defined reduction goals and strategy and actions, the slogan alone can be quite hollow in a hurry. And then third, engage. We need to collaborate with many other stakeholders, such as public sectors, society at large, to tackle this issue together as a team. So that's what I'd like to leave with you, commit, operationalize, and engage as a working model for my colleagues in the industry. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shin. I love CEOs uh, who are having concrete plans and certainly principles as you just uh, mentioned, and also being a mathematician laying out all the numbers so that we can achieve them on time. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, having said that, let me move on to uh, another round of discussion with all of you. You have already beautifully laid out the plan that you have, you know, the principle that will lead us there. So tell us some more concrete uh, issues as to what you're working on right now. What are some of the challenges? How are you overcoming these challenges? For example, uh, in Tokyo, I mean, this is a huge metropolitan city, uh, Governor Koike. I just wonder how many stakeholders you have to engage in this process in order to achieve the goals that you just said, and how many people you have to talk to to talk about time to act and time to act. Governor Koike. Thank you. 
Uh, Tokyo's population, for just for your information, we have 14 million. Um, sure. Not uh, big enough. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> as a leading eco-friendly city and an international financial center, Tokyo is implementing various measures to find solutions to environmental and financial challenges. First, as one initiative, we are taking to accelerate actions for a 50% reduction of CO2 emissions. Uh, we recently announced the banning of all sales of new gas-fueled cars in Tokyo by 2030. And, and Tokyo is a member of the C40. That is a group of major cities, uh, including New York, London, Paris, and those major cities in the world dedicated to tackling climate change, which I serve as a vice chair. And we will work with the other C40 member cities as well as with the businesses, NGOs, and other organizations to call for climate action, a global move movement against climate change. Now, regarding sustainable buildings, uh, we have so many tall and big buildings in Tokyo, and which boast uh, a high environmental performance based on our years of of experience and expertise in this field, we will demonstrate leadership in their promotion. And this will be facilitated by ESG Finance. And we are advancing initiatives that combine the environment and finance as measures to promote ESG investing. And these mm -hmm. include, yes, these include issuing Tokyo Green, Boat, green Bonds Tokyo and Tokyo was the first local government in Japan to issue such funds and creating a Tokyo ESG fund for investment in renewable energy. And as I just mentioned, we plan to make Tokyo a leading city in green finance. To do so, we will build a system to attract capital for ESG investing from within and outside Japan and for the creation of what we tentatively call the Tokyo Green Finance Market. This is what we are uh, tackling and challenging. Thank you, Governor Koke. I really love the atmosphere right here in this panel, because we see <laughs> a very voluntary, friendly competition is going on about the concrete plans and also actions to be implemented. Now let's go to another Asian colleague uh, coming from South Korea, uh, uh, CEO, uh, CEO of LG Chem, Mr. Shane. What about your engagement of stakeholders? Every country has their own unique uh, cultural and also business background. How are you doing that with your company in South Korea? Tell me more about it. Right. Obviously, collaboration uh, is the key in making this work. Uh, public sector, industry, uh, and society at large, uh, and industry should also talk to industry. Uh, because some of these technologies, like carbon capture utilization, is so big uh, that not one single company can perfect the technology. So we have to work together, uh, maybe with even with the government, in terms of this uh, commercialization of technology. Uh, but it is so obvious that uh, industry or industry alone uh, cannot achieve the reduction goal. I'll give you an example. Uh, without getting full access to uh, renewable energy infrastructure uh, and the policies in place to be able to directly purchase the, the renewable energy power from the source, uh, it will be difficult to achieve RE100 goal uh, as an industry. Uh, this is where public sector and its policy uh, come into play. As far as carbon reduction from manufacturing processes, uh, we are still relying on some major technical breakthrough that has yet to happen. It uh, has to do with the processing technology, such as how to capture carbon and utilize it, uh, what's the energy equation to make it happen, and uh, catalyst technology and all that. Uh, the magnitude of this type of technical challenge is so big that no one company can perfect this technology alone. Hence the need for its essential industry partnership and collaboration. In terms of technology, it is my view that uh, we need to unleash full muscles of innovation and modern technologies to tackle this issue. Uh, for example, uh, we need mm -hmm. full deployment of data science 
and AI technology to optimize energy consumption in all of our, of our operation. So technology and innovation uh, have a huge role to play here. Um, Absolutely. You asked about the uh, leadership uh, aspect of this, how to transform the organization among many other things, I guess I will narrow it down to uh, eventually CEO's personal conviction and passion around climate change. I think their passion and conviction become contagious in the organization. And we all know that uh, once we get our mm -hmm. people's hearts and minds, uh, then they'll be able to uh, move the mountains. And uh, frankly, nothing less than moving the mountains is the type of monumental task ahead of us. Mm. Contagious has been a word we are all very sensitive about <laughs> over the year 2020. However, contagious in this sense is in this absolutely case, is encouraged. <laughs> absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, we heard the Asian voices. Let's back, go back to the European voices. Um, Deputy Governor, uh, Deputy Prime Minister, would you help us to understand how your country, Spain, and together with your colleague within the European Union, preparing for COP26 in Glasgow uh, later in November, how do you think governments now could really get their policies concrete and done? We are talking about actions. Please. <laughs> I think Minister. that, um, no, thank you, thank you. I think we are inspired as uh, we were the CEO of LG, so working on a, a, a commit, operationalize and engage. Commit, commit, because I think that we have to be serious to fix the targets, to describe the strategy and the pathways. So to pay attention to anyone, but uh, providing a good uh, atmosphere and a good picture of things being achievable. This is very important, otherwise it looks impossible. Um, operationalize, I think this is also very important and we've done a lot and sometimes it's not easy. I think that fixing the framework in the legal context, but also being very serious in the policies is quite key. For instance, we are going through a huge industrial reconversion of the energy sector. Uh, that has allowed us to take some benefits. So the price of energy has been reduced uh, almost 40% in less than the year, the two years, sorry. And we have uh, close 90% of the coal in less than two years, but stressing the solidarity policies and measures. So ensuring that no one feels left behind. This is also very important because it is quite an emotional shock. We need to raise public awareness and to go through this social territorial dimension with natural-based solutions and the restoration of ecosystems. And this is also to be very important in Glasgow to make the right connections between the different elements so to ensure that value, cost, finance get increasingly aligned. And finally, I think that engagement is very key. At the top, so the Prime Minister and the whole cabinet being engaged and going to see the reality and the policies and commitments through the glasses of climate action and the consistency with climate action and safety. And um, we have to be humble and listen to people because I think that uh, all these pathways need some flexibility. Nobody knows how to achieve the whole success without combining, correcting or improving what uh, we are doing. And I think that uh, these are things that will be reflected in Glasgow. We need to be bold in terms of commitments. What about fossil fuels? What about the do not harm post uh, principle? What about uh, the type of uh, pressure that uh, Christian Mumerat was uh, stressing, but also the benefits of doing things properly? Only that uh, could allow us to go beyond what we've got today. Mm. Mr. Momentelli from Swiss Re. Tell me more, how do you think from the private sector really rally more into the efforts, uh, particularly leading up to a Glasgow COP26? And certainly we see other conferences, for example, global conferences on biodiversity and many others addressing uh, similar issues on green development. Yeah, no, I'm very inspired by uh, Mr. Shin. So I, I, let me use this framework. Uh, to say what concretely can be done by, by CEOs all across the world who hopefully listen to us. So I think the first thing is you need to commit to net zero 2050. And as everybody has stressed, this is uncomfortable because no CEO can today say exactly how they will get there. So you need the leap of faith. You need to know you have to do it. That's the first thing. Operationalize. I think every company can do an analysis of all the projects they could do internally to reduce CO2. 
and to sort them by uh, return period, by costs and benefits. And I think every company who has done that, who I know, 20 to 40 percent can actually be done in a shareholder friendly way. You don't need the help of anybody. These are things you invest and you have a payback time of three, four years. Uh, so the beginning of this path to 2050, I think, is relatively easy. Uh, then you have a middle part, which is not economical today, which is much harder. And then you have a final part, which is near impossible to get rid of. And for these two parts, I would, I would uh, ask people to engage uh, and engage in particular, I have a particular interest with the Alliance of CEO Climate Leaders here at the WEF, we have 80 CEOs who have all committed to 2050 mm -hmm. and realize that for this second and third bucket, we will need to work together. So for example, this, the second bucket, which is difficult, there's a whole value chain problem today that many industries for whom it is extremely difficult to do it in a shareholder friendly way, actually deliver their product to some companies who uh, create end user products. And while it's very difficult for these companies to get to net zero, uh, once you put these costs to the end product, it's actually not costing much more. So a pair of jeans would be $1 more if it was produced net zero. A car would be $500 more if it was produced net zero. So there's an opportunity for the companies who, deliver, who, have, uh, who create products for the end consumer to work together uh, with uh, upstream, with all the deliverers, with all the suppliers to get to a more uh, net zero world. And finally, I think also Mr. Shin has said it, for the impossible part, we will need to develop technologies to extract CO2 from the atmosphere. It can be planting forests, of course, but it could also be technologies which are not here today and which will be necessary. There's no way to get to net zero without technologies to extract uh, CO2 from the atmosphere and people don't talk enough about it. Our estimation is this industry has to be as big as the oil and gas industry today. Mm -hmm. That's how enormous this has to become by, by 2050. And there's also something where CEOs can work together to develop this. All right. Thank you. I don't think our time is enough because everyone has a lot to share. That's a great thing. Before we go, let's have this, what they call the popcorn style. One word from everyone so that we know what we have in mind moving forward. Let's start with Deputy Prime Minister. Madam Deputy Prime Minister, please. One word. Action. Wonderful, I love it. Let's go to Governor Koike, the two women leaders in the panel. One word. Okay, then time to act. <laughs> go back to the slogan. Uh, Mr. Shin from South Korea. <laughs> Right. I have three words, commit, operationalize, and engage. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Last but not least, uh, Mr. Moment Howley. Commit net zero 2050. <laughs> Wonderful. Ladies and gentlemen, what a pleasure talking to you and certainly see that not only the determination, but real actions already taking place, not just in this panel, but also in real life. Uh, thank you so much. I want to thank uh, our organizers as well, giving us this platform to talk about this most crucial issue. Later in the day, since we have time difference from different parts of the world, we're going to have a similar panel uh, from North America as well about the mobilizing actions on climate change. We hope we can certainly compare notes and this is about global cooperation. Thank you so much once again to all of you and our audience. Thank you. Thanks. Thank Bye. You. Thank you. Bye.